Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another week of Slingshot. It is so good to see you online today, whether you're watching on Instagram or YouTube. We are so glad that you're here. My name is Luke. If I've not gotten the chance to meet you yet, I'm the middle school coordinator right here at Rock Harbor Church. And I'm super excited because we're actually in the middle of a series called In the Eyes of God, that we're discovering who we are, who God has made us to be. Because as a middle schooler, you are discovering right now who you are as a person. And sometimes that can be very difficult because we we try to place our identity or our value in the wrong thing, specifically the opinions of other people. Because we sometimes tie our, our worth or our value in, in what other people think about us, how accepted we are. This causes us to be tossed to and fro and it makes us feel so confused as to who we really are, who we really have been made to be. But when we place our identity in God and in His Word and what, and what it's, His Word says about you and me, then we are able to have a secure foundation in order to build our identity upon. So if you can remember back to week one, week one we talked about how that you are chosen by God, that God sent His only Son Jesus to earth to live a perfect life, to die, and then rise again three days later to show you that you are accepted, chosen, and loved by Him. And then last week, we talked about how you are made new. That for those of us who accept Jesus, that beforehand, before we knew God, before we entered into a relationship with Him, the Bible says that we were spiritually dead. But after we enter into a relationship with God, we are made spiritually alive. That because of God's grace and His forgiveness, we are made new. And maybe as you've seen, as we've gone through these few weeks, that we are not only talking about who you are and who God has made you to be, but we're also going through a bit of a progression, a journey into what it's like to be a Christ follower. We're going to be continuing that journey today. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn here. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1, which is in the New Testament towards the end of the Bible. So as you're turning there, this letter is written by Peter, who was one of the apostles of Jesus. And that meant that he walked, talked, and actually got to hang out with Jesus while he was on earth. And during that time, Jesus had, had called Peter, hey, you're going to be a fisher of men upon this rock. I'm going to build my church. Uh, Peter actually got to walk on water, did, did some incredible things. And Peter is actually writing to this letter several years after Jesus had, had departed from earth, had ascended back into heaven. And he's writing this letter to encourage Christ followers. Because at the time that Peter is writing this, Christians around the world were being persecuted. And this isn't like, ha, ah, you're a Christian, you dork. It wasn't anything like that. It was more like people were being killed, people were being imprisoned, and, and people were being separated from their families. All these kinds of things were happening just because people believed in Jesus. And not only that, but there's also these false teachers that are appearing, meaning that there's these guys who would say, oh yeah, I follow Jesus, oh yeah, I believe in what God says, and yet they would teach a completely different idea than what the truth actually is. And so Peter is writing this letter to Christ followers, showing them what it means to be a dedicated, devoted follower of Christ. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So if you have your Bible, again, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 3. But here's what Peter says. He says that his, meaning God's, divine power, basically just meaning this is God's power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So what Peter is saying here is that God's power gives us everything we need to live a godly life. You see, sometimes I think when people think, oh, when I become a Christian, it's going to be so hard. There's all these rules. I have to do this, 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 this. And if I don't do this, then it's all a sham. But what Peter is writing here is that God gives us everything we need in order to, to live a godly life. All right? he, he gives us everything we need. So he continues and he says this, going back to verse 3, through the knowledge of him, who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So what Peter is saying here is that because of God's power and because of the fact that we're in a relationship with God, that we actually get to see all of the amazing things that God can do and to see how truly remarkable our God is. And not only that, but we also get to receive God's promises. And as we read throughout the Bible and you're thinking, okay, what are God's promises? We see things like salvation, right? That for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That for those of us who believe Jesus, that's true for us. And God also promises to protect us, to watch out for us, that he is our provider. And, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And as Christ followers, we get to receive these promises. He continues and he says, so that through them, through these promises, 
you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. Now I'll focus on the phrase partakers of the divine nature. What in the heck does that mean? Basically all that means is that as Christ followers, we get to share in God's holiness, meaning that we get to be more like God and less like this corrupt world. Because as Peter points out, as we learned last week, that if we live according to this world, if we live as though we don't know who Jesus is, if we live as though we haven't been changed by him, then we're living as though we're spiritually dead. And that's not what God wants for us. God wants us to enjoy what he has to offer. God wants us to enjoy the relationship that is found in him. And that's what he calls us to partake in and to forsake the corrupt nature of our world. But this next part, if you've been tuning me out, that's okay. I'm bringing you back. Focus back on me here. We're going to be focusing in on these next seven things that Peter is writing to these Christ followers. These seven qualities that Peter says are are necessary in, 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 in your walk to be a Christ follower. So he says this in verse five. He says, for this reason, make every effort. That means that you are trying your hardest. You're giving your best to supplement your faith, so to support your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. That's where we'll stop right there. But as Peter's writing this, again, he's saying that give it your best effort to support your faith with these seven qualities. And he lists them. So this first one that he says is virtue. All right, and what's virtue? Maybe you hear, okay, patience is a virtue. Um, you know, kindness is a virtue. And you're right. Virtue is simply living as Christ lived. So we look to the example of Jesus. And we say, okay, what, what sorts of things did Jesus do while he was on earth? And what sorts of things does God do for us today? And we look at in Jesus' story specifically, and we see how Jesus served other people. Right, that he spoke to other people in love and he also told other people the truth. He respected other people. All of these kinds of things are, are ways that we live a life of virtue. And these are the kind of things that help support our faith. The next thing that Peter says is that we need to have knowledge. We need to have knowledge. So we obviously become more like Jesus by knowing more about Jesus. Does that make sense? So think about it this way, is that if, if I were to ask one of your best friends, right? If I were to ask one of your best friends, hey, tell me about this person. So basically, tell me about you. If I were to ask one of your best friends, and if your best friend's your mom, that's cool too. Moms can be good friends, right? But if I were to ask them, okay, tell me about you. And if they were to say, well, you know, I'm not really sure. I think that their birthday is this day. I think their favorite color is green. And they go to this school, I, I'm pretty sure, right? If that was your best friend, wouldn't that kind of hurt your feelings a little bit? Like, I feel like you should know me better than that. And that's kind of how it is whenever we're, we're continuing to know more about Jesus, right? That we want to really know who Jesus is. And not only that, but we also don't want to gain these like random trivia facts. And not that knowing all these facts about Jesus is bad, but we really want to know who Jesus is as a being, as a person. And that is the kind of knowledge that Peter encourages us to have about Jesus. The next thing that Peter says is that we need to be self-controlled. Now, that does not sound fun at all, but as a follower of Jesus, we need to be self-controlled. Because as we know is that if we are not self-controlled, right? If we do whatever I feel like doing, oh, I feel like doing this today. Even though I know it's wrong, I'm still going to do it. Even though I know this is going to hurt someone's feelings or this is going to offend somebody, ah, I'm going to say it anyways. That that is not how we are called to live. And so, and so often when we are not self-controlled, that leads us so far away from Jesus. And that's not what God wants at all. So it's important for us to be self-controlled, to know that, hey, I struggle with this, but I'm not gonna, just going to give into it. I'm not just going to let it have free reign over my mind, my body, my spirit. That instead, I'm going to continue to surround myself with, with other people who can encourage me, point me back on the right track. I'm going to read the Bible and see what it has to say and, and encourage me in this area that we're learning how we can become more and more self-controlled. The next thing that Peter says is that we need to be steadfast, right? This basically means that we need to patiently endure and to keep going even when life becomes difficult. As we talked about a few weeks ago, we were actually did a whole series on this called How to Keep Going. 
but talking about how do we keep going when life becomes difficult. And that we know that God gives us the strength we need to keep going. Right? As, as people who believe and follow Jesus, that because of God's presence actually living within us, we have the strength to keep going. But it's up to us. It's up to you and me to come to Him, right? To come to Him with our problems, to follow after Him, and not just on Sundays, not just on uh, when we do our Bible study, but every single day, following Him. And then we're also choosing to trust Him as well, knowing that even though we can't see what's going to happen, we don't know what the outcome is, we trust that He is a good God who is looking out for His kids. The next thing that Peter says is that if we're going to become a Christ follower, a disciple of Jesus, that we need to be godly. We need to pursue godliness. And godliness simply means that we are seeking God every single day. For as we do, that, that to, excuse me, the temptations of this life, right? The things that we get tempted by, the things that we know, I'm not supposed to do this, but yet I can't seem to like, not want to do this, or the pressures of this life as well, the things that weigh us down, the burdens, the anxiety, the depression, the anger, these, these negative thoughts, all these things that pile up on our minds, then when we're pursuing God, when we seek after Him, as, as Matthew says, with all of our hearts, then we will be closer to Him. And through that, even though we still have to walk through temptation, even though we still have to walk through things that are difficult, they are much less difficult to handle because we have God with us. And it's His strength that is carrying us through. And oftentimes we'll be able to see how He leads us out of those difficult situations. But that's up to us to, again, to pursue Him, to trust in Him. That means that we are reading our Bible every single day, connecting with the God's Word, whether that's actually picking up your Bible, whether that's reading a devotional, whether that's watching a message, whatever it is. Spending time in God's Word is such a powerful tool for us in order to become more godly. Also talking through someone who is pursuing God, or, or, or praying, or doing all these things that we know we're supposed to be doing to seek after God every single day. This next thing is brotherly affection. Right? And simply put, it means that we need to be community-minded. That we need to treat other people the way that Christ has treated us, even when it is difficult to do so. That even though we may disagree with somebody, and even though someone may say that, that you know, we may classify someone as our enemy, the Bible still commands us that we need to love these people. That we still need to love them as Christ has loved us, which leads us into the final thing, which is love itself. And again, this isn't the kind of love like the love you feel for tacos or the love you feel for your pet hamster or anything like that. This is the kind of love that Jesus displayed for us. In fact, in John chapter 15, Jesus told his disciples that you must love one another as I have loved you. And what we know about Jesus is he loved us with a sacrificial love, meaning that he was willing to give up the things that he wanted, maybe even the things that he needed to serve other people. And so maybe for you, maybe that's something as simple as instead of playing video games for seven hours a day, maybe you, when you go in the kitchen, you see that, hey, there's a lot of dishes in the sink. And I know that those dishes have to be done. And I know that my mom usually does them, but I have the time, I'll do the dishes, right? That's a simple way that you can serve somebody else and make your mom happy at the same time, which is never a bad thing. Or here's another example. Maybe you know that there's a kid down the street or maybe some kid who goes to your school who doesn't have a whole lot of friends. And so right now with the fact that we are all separated because of Corona and the fact that we are limited to how we gather, they're probably feeling lonelier than ever because not only were they lonely at school, but, but now they're, they're lonely because they don't have anyone to hang out with over the summer. So maybe that's something as simple as walking down the street saying, hey man, or hey lady, whatever, why don't you come hang out with me? Why don't you come hang out with my friends? Why don't, why don't you come over to our house and we'll do this? That is a great way to show the kind of love that God has showed us. And Peter actually continues after he lists these seven virtues and he says that people who don't pursue these things are ineffective, right? These people who, who don't practice these seven things, who don't continue to grow in their relationship with God are ineffective as believers. Just like an athlete, right? If you're trained to become an athlete, you know you got to practice, you got to work out, and you got to eat right. And, but imagine how good of an athlete you would be if you ate pizza and milkshakes, you didn't go to practice, and you didn't exercise. Do you think you'd be a good athlete? Of course not. Just like that, when we don't practice these things on our faith, when we don't continue to grow in virtue and knowledge, steadfastness and so on, 
We are ineffective as believers. And Peter actually goes as far to say that, that whoever doesn't do these things is so nearsighted that he's actually blind. He's blind to the fact that he has been forgiven so much, blind to the fact that he's received this life-transforming gift of a relationship with Jesus, and he returns to the way that he used to be before, spiritually dead. But he goes on to say that those who do pursue God, who do pursue these seven qualities, that they are able to receive and experience the treasure of knowing God, that they are able to overcome their obstacles a whole lot easier They still have obstacles, but they're still able to overcome those a whole lot easier because they are focusing their attention on God. And again, they're able to experience the treasure of knowing God, walking with God, and being with Him. Because, you guys, God has given you everything you need to succeed. God has given you everything that you need in order to pursue Him, to follow Him, and to live a godly life. In the eyes of God, you're equipped You are called to make a difference in this world. And I know sometimes the temptation is, well, you know, God can use someone so much better than me. There's probably someone out there who reads their Bible five times a day, that they are at church every Sunday. Then during their free time, I know that I watch Netflix or play video games, but they're probably at the Salvation Army, at the soup kitchen or whatever. God uses someone like them, not like me. And that's not true at all. When we read in God's Word, is that God uses people who just trust Him, people who believe in Him. And that's you, hopefully, that, that when you believe in God, that you are called, that Christ followers, we are meant to be influencers. We're supposed to be world-changing, God-following people. And that's the kind of life that God has called you to. But it's ultimately up to you to do something about it. So my question to you today is this, is that are you following after God? That if you're a believer, are you truly practicing these things that Peter described? And maybe for you, it's asking, okay, what are some of the things that I I struggle with in these areas? What are some of the qualities that Peter talked about out of these seven things that I tend to struggle with? And then how can you grow in those things? So maybe for you, it's that, hey, I really don't know a whole lot about the Bible. I've read a few verses, but that's about it. Maybe it's spending time saying, hey, every single day, I'm just going to read one verse. Just one verse, and I'm going to pray after I read it, so that way I can understand more of God's Word and know more of who Jesus is. Maybe for you, it's self-control that you do whatever you want to do and it doesn't matter what anyone says, you're going to do it anyway. Maybe for you it's redirecting and saying, hey, you know what, I know that this is a destructive path that I'm on. I need to get people around me who can encourage me and who can help point me back on the right track. I need these kinds of friends in my life. Whatever it is, discover ways that you can continue to grow closer to God so you can experience the joy and the treasure of knowing Him and walking with Him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today, and thank you for this, this uh, passage of Scripture, Lord, from Peter. I know that this is convicting for me. It, it pulls on my heart because, God, I know that I fall short in all seven of these things. But, God, I thank you that your love doesn't give up on me, that you continue to forgive me. And I pray, Jesus, for everyone who's watching right now and for myself, that we would continue to look to these seven things, and we would continue to look to you, Lord, and how we can draw closer to you because we know that the more that we know you, the more that we want to spend time with you. And the more that we spend time with you, God, the more that our lives are changed. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. Thank you for all that you are. And God, we love you so much. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that you will join us next week. We are going to be concluding this series in the eyes of God um, by, by talking about the fact that you have a future with God. So we hope to see you back here next week and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for watching.